I don't want to say it makes like a hundred percent difference, but it definitely makes a difference what you put on the store, whether it's like seven or eight screenshot. I know the statistics they do say maybe less than five percent of people actually do scroll that far. But hey, I mean, I was just relying on the data, and it came up the same way as we wanted twice in a row. So there might be something to it. Hello and welcome to Behind the Game, a podcast where we talk to experts in the gaming industry. Today we are talking to Matej Jerkak, an ASO lead for Pixel Federation with a background in creative assets, monetization, social media, and community management. Thank you so much for being here. I kind of was talking to Isma about this a couple weeks ago, and I think it's really interesting because, you know, when we were younger, you didn't really wake up one day and were like, I want to, you know, be in the gaming industry, like that's what I want to do when I grow up. So I always like to ask people, how did you get here? How did you find your way to the gaming industry? What passions did you follow? Well, maybe I'm the exception because I always wanted to be part of the gaming industry. I just never was before um, because I was actually studying to be an accountant. Then I wanted to do something with, like I majored in economic journalism and economic theories. And then not a turn of events. I was part of the AT&T working as a, like a business unit project manager, corporate job. And somebody, there was a colleague of mine who at the time identified Pixel Federation within Bratislava and told me there is actually a game studio in Bratislava making mobile games or games in general. And uh, anything else just didn't matter to me at, from that point moving forward. It was just a problem of they didn't have any open positions that would fit me. And basically I got didn't have nothing to offer to them. So I was uh, the only role I could apply for was the community manager. But then again, they had the, uh, they required German language as well. And I was not really fluent in German at that point. I'm still not, but uh, I was pretty confident in English. And once I guess they were not able to fill that position for a German speaker, they removed that one requirement. And from that moment, I applied and went to do an interview. They liked me. And uh, I've been with the company for like seven plus years. How did you go from a community manager to where you are now? Yeah, it was quite the journey. I've been working as a community manager for like two plus years, but I was kind of feeling this might not be the right fit for me. Uh, long story short, I there is only so much hate you can take uh, with, <laughs> with that comes with mm-hmm. the support tickets you have to uh, yep. answer to. <laughs> yep. And at one point I was like, this is this is just enough. And uh, there was another position open at the social media team. So I, they promised a bit more freedom and creativity. And I wanted to do just that. I wanted to learn how to work with uh, visuals. I wanted to work, uh, learn how to work with uh, creating video, stuff like that. So that's why I decided to join the social media team. And uh, I was doing just that. We were doing like a small YouTube series called Pixel News. When uh, me and a colleague of mine, we were anchoring the show. It was like a short... Uh, something like daily fix from the IGN. We just wanted to do like a brief overview mm-hmm. of what's going on within our game portfolio to our players. And it was, it was a, a monthly edition. So that was pretty cool. I was doing it for like a year and a half. And then because I loved to loved to write some contracts for the games that we have and uh, like coming up with the lore and the backstories for the characters, uh, somebody else from the uh, marketing team at that time approached me and asked me if I wanted to try out to do an ASO description for the game. He like identified the keywords for me and told me these keywords have to be used several amount of times. And I should come up with the text that would make sense. Like these are the main uh, p- uh, points I should stick to. And uh, that was it. They liked, the, they liked the text that I came up with and they offered me the position to join marketing as an ASO guy. I didn't know there's way more to it at that point. I thought it's like writing the text and that's it, sticking to keywords. And I liked that idea, so I went for it. Cool. And that was like <laughs> four years ago. Yeah. But what game was that? For, was for any specific, like for Train Station or for the Adventure? It was for Train Station, actually, for the for the contract partners you're working with. It's so funny that you were talking about getting hate as a community manager, which you get some too from working on social media as well. I actually got a Discord message yesterday from like one of our games, and they were like, I'll give you 50 Robux if I can have your account on Rodeo Stampede. And I'm like, 50 Robux is not even like a ton of, like, I don't know. It's just so funny the messages you get, especially working in like the mobile industry, because a lot of them are children. And so they tend to sometimes cuss a lot at you because they feel safe and they don't feel like they're going to get in trouble. So. Handling that is, um, 
tricky because how do you respond in such a calm manner without, you know, making them more angry and trying to keep like a level head and resolve the situation? Well, nowadays, I want to say it's a bit easier because of the AI helpers and uh, maybe yeah. some automated responses and templates. Uh, back uh, seven years ago when we used to do it, uh, when I used to do it, there was a, we also had templates, but I had to like manually find them within one document and like control copy, control paste, and uh, this is it. But yeah, I mean, the customer service and customer support service within Pixel Federation goes above and beyond for their players, uh, offering like extra services. Like, for example, we do have special offer in our games. And once that expires, you can still purchase the items from that we're offering that offer. But you have to contact the support directly, and they will like fulfill your request even additionally. And that takes a lot of work. You know, yeah. It's like a lot of dedication to the players. For sure. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I know. I mean, no wonder why you you've been having the game live for for a lot, for years, right? So you you build that community, you build a user base that it's loyal, and what less that being loyal to them, especially now that is so so challenging to come up with a new title and sure. and to release a new game. It's important to to keep up with the games that you have and and the communities and and of course the life ops, right? Definitely. Um, I mean, the end of the, at the end of the day, they are the ones that keep your engine going. So uh, I think you should like reciprocate somehow. And this is this is our way how we do it to keep them engaged. Engaged. And 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 when you got in, in into ASO and and you thought, okay, cool, I just need to write some words, come up with keywords, and then you you figure out and you saw that oh, where am I at? It's it's way more than that. How, yeah. how was that experience? How how was how overwhelming it was. What was like a key takeout takeaway that you will advise to somebody who's trying to make it by their own, for example? Well, it was a. I don't. I don't want to say it was an unpleasant surprise because I was just starting out with Photoshop and I got the chance to stretch this new ability and uh, find out what I actually do know, what I don't know, learn about the uh, the rules or guidelines that we have to follow. So it was, it was not like a bad thing. I uh, kind of welcome, there's a whole new dimension that I have to follow through. I got to talk to a lot of people who were, uh, well, like the, the ASO process was already pretty okay in works within Pixel Federation when I joined the team. So it was just like the guy uh, who was uh, teaching me the ASO within the company, He his idea was to move away from the ASO and he wanted to find another guy who will take over the whole agenda. So he told me all the, all the tricks and uh, all the ropes. And uh, it was pretty okay, actually. Um, but what advice would I have to would I give to somebody who's just uh, starting to work with it? It's just basically there is plenty of materials available online for free, uh, of offering uh, like the basic guidelines, the basic rules, the basic steps you have to follow. Just uh, dedicate like an hour or two to reading those, and uh, everything else comes up natural. If you're struggling with something make sure to just open up the internet and start searching for something you're struggling with and now when it comes to best practices you will find all of them online for free when it comes to digging deeper when it comes to data sure that's a bit more trickier because you have to go deeper within and use some third-party tools not all of them are for free that can right. definitely help and take the your aso game to the whole new level but when it comes to very very basics it's everything's online nowadays just go there and search for it i'm sure you will find it do you have any favorite place to go uh, for that? Just as out of curiosity. Not really, but when you use, uh, sign up to a lot of newsletters, all of the information gets delivered to you personally. You know, you don't even have to go nowhere. And there is a one Slack community that I highly recommend. It's uh, ASO Stacks, like by feature. A lot of ASO practitioners and professionals gather there, and you can get all the information from the promotions channel. Like the, you could be the first one literally to read it. Do you have any big like um, stories or memories, like big wins, and then also maybe like a story of a big loss in terms of ASO or even social media? Like, do you have like you don't know one campaign that did really well and then one campaign that did really badly? I didn't want to say I do, but uh, there's been a couple of wins. Uh, there was a huge discussion. Well, it's not it's not like a huge win, but it was like a huge win uh, for the ASO team because there was an argument going on 
whether the seventh or eighth or one of the last screenshots used within the screenshots, does it actually make a difference? Like people don't even see it. And uh, the, like the people from the product, from the game team, they were trying to pursue it as it does not make any sense to work on that or focus on that or polish it. And now uh, we ran a couple of experiments, just uh, iterating nothing else but the last screenshots. And the results were actually pretty, pretty in our favor. Uh, so we were actually kind of right in these terms, or maybe it was just a coincidence, but I don't want to admit it. I think it's still, <laughs> I, think it's still we uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think we were right. So uh, I don't want to say it makes like a hundred percent difference, but it definitely makes a difference what you put on the store, whether it's just like seven or eight screenshot. I know the status, statistics, they do say maybe less than 5% of people actually do scroll that far. But hey, I mean, I was just relying on the data and it came up the same way as we as we won it twice in a row. So there might be something to it. So there's, it's not like a huge win, but it was a huge win internally. Right. Interesting. I recently, <laughs> this might seem really simple, but we just recently, we have, you know, horizontal or uh, landscape style games. And for a while we were having landscape style, like screenshots and then like it, for some, we kind of thought about it and we're like, when you're looking on the app store, you know, even if the game is, you know, landscape, you're, you're still looking at it like this. So we, you know, changed all of the orientation to portrait the screenshots and um, it did really well. So I feel like that's kind of a, it should be almost make sense, but um, yeah. Have you kind of experienced with landscape versus portrait? Funny that you mentioned it because we've applied the winning, uh, winning variant just today and it was the exact same case. We've been, uh, since I can remember, since our games are all in landscape, we've been always using the landscape uh, screenshots. And just today, the test was running for about 20 days and it was like super, super positive. There was increase uh, by like 20% with the conversion rate, moving it from, I think like 470 to 520 in total on the App Store actually. And it was applied just today, proving a point that there might be something to it. But since our games are all in landscape, we had to come up with another way how to do it. And we basically sliced the landscape portrait into three into, into three portrait screenshots. It's super interesting too, because even the different geos, um, for example, the Japanese really like having text on, yeah. at least this is what we have found. They like having text on the screenshots versus sometimes, you know, Western countries prefer just kind of images. So it's really been, I have also recently gotten into the ASO world. So, um, it's kind of fun to talk to you, but um, it's really interesting to see how much it can impact across the different geos in the world and, you know, countries and all that stuff. Uh, yeah, I actually do have an example to that as well. Uh, very often and a huge debate within Pixel Federation was whether to include text into those images or not. Uh, the way how we do A-B testing in our end, for the Google Play at least, is that we only run our tests, or we used to run our tests on the primary geos only. And depending on the results from the primary geos, we've been applying to those uh, to the main store listing as well. Well, uh, including text uh, for the uh, primary geos, it never worked. 100% of the time, we've seen negative results when applying text to the images. Even when we tried to go for the localized versions, like trying to run the test on the US only, so we are making sure we are only using English words for the English speaking country. Same case, never works for us. All of our competitors that I've noticed, they are using the text. It's been working for them. There's been huge, not, not huge, but there's been like a lot of re, uh, arguments coming from the projects and uh, from the game teams. Why are we not using the text in our, uh, in our images? And the argument coming back was pretty simple. Like, let's look at the data. It never worked for us. And uh, I would not recommend going with the gut feeling if the data does not support it. So that's why right. we don't have the text, yeah. you know, screenshot. Right. I also, I mean, obviously, I think it also depends on the game because, you know, we have like a fight style game and then we also have like an endless runner like game kind mm -hmm. of more tailored for children. So like they obviously have very different um, demographics and audiences. So, you know, it also kind of depends on that once you go from there. We used to play with the keywords from different countries and, and, and mix it, especially with the U.S. and Mexico, because many Spanish speakers were in the U.S. as well. How do you approach localization in, in that sense for languages and keywords? Because it's something that it was really interesting because we tried once and it worked super well. And, but it, it felt like a completely different world <laughs> that you needed to put a ton of hours to, to figure out the key formula. 
Yeah, uh, I agree. I've only done the test with the Mexican and the uh, US uh, store listing, also the languages, like a couple times. I've not seen that big of a like an increase or a difference or that, that would support uh, the effort that goes for optimizing for those two countries. I do know that there is a like very, very close correlations between those two markets, but I've not been exercising this too much. Do you use any ASO strategy when you want to span to different markets? Like for example, you want to, I don't know, like one example, you want to span to Japan or, or to South Korea. Do you have a, do you work with the close with the marketing and user acquisition team? to work on a strategy together to approach that market? Yeah, actually we uh, wanted to expand to Japan as well and we wanted to get as culturalized from the ASO perspective as possible. So we've been working from, <laughs> So we've been working with a third party agency. I, I, I don't think I could, but I, I even can't remember the name of them. Um, they, and again, they came up with something that it's fitting for the Japanese market. Just like you mentioned, like a lot of text, pretty much a chaos in one picture, but there was like a, the main idea was to display train and everything that comes with it. A lot of text, uh, characters, uh, just like a mess of a screenshot, but fitting the Japanese market. And it wasn't working very well for us. Like, uh, no, we put some money into this uh, cooperation and uh, the results were like, okay, at best. Uh, but I think even the, like the English sc uh, screenshot set that we've been using for the primary juice, it, I think it even outperformed the Japanese customized one. So uh, in speaking screenshot wise, did not make much of a difference to get super, super culturalized. However, when we were trying to expand, like uh, get a bit culturalized in Korea, we always, what are we trying to do is to uh, find out for the train game, find out which is the most common train used or uh, that is traveling through the Korea mm -hmm. the, the most and try to make it like a key visual try to come up with the key visual yeah. of putting that train for us for the screenshots for the uh basically so the korean players can see this train as soon as possible and we are still hoping like it's a reason it resonates with them and in case it does we just use them we create a custom store listing for that particular country and we will we will be using that train if it doesn't we'll just stick with what works best Man, I thought Japan was going to war. I remember talking this with Gustav because I was uh, we told before I was going to Tokyo Game Show and, and we were talking about how the demographics and in Japan, there is like, even in the arcades, you can find machines for train simulators and there is a huge audience. It's a little bit niche and maybe it's hard to find it, but there is a lot of potential. And even if I'm not mistaken, maybe I'm wrong, you do have a war for Japan on train simulator too, if I'm wrong. Uh, it's one of the last ones I didn't get there, but I remember. So I thought you were going to get something like collaborate with any of the brands or or something that could figure out. But I try also to get you somebody, but I couldn't find any anyone in the conference because I remember I, I still having the the <laughs> business card from Gusta. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's true. We do have a Japanese region in the transition to game. Uh, but however, at that point, I thought I don't think uh, we were thinking of uh, cooperating with the real brands. Uh, yeah. when they were coming up with the regions or whatever. And uh, yeah, I think Japan market from the UA perspective is working for us okay. Well, I want to say okay, but it's like uh, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But overall, I think it's all right. And uh, for, But from the ASO perspective, it's we were hoping to achieve a lot more by getting the culturalized screenshots. And uh, I don't want to say like we explored it to its full potential, but we never done like a lot of iterations of those screenshots, which was maybe a mistake. But at the same time, every iteration of those screenshots, because it was not being done in house and we did not have the PSDs to iterate those ourselves, it always comes with a cost and the cost was just, uh, was not very effective for us. Do you ever do any localization in terms of live ops? We do localization with every live ops event that we do. Like, for example, games are being localizing to, well, mostly to the languages that are bringing in revenues. Uh, but those are Japanese, but those are Irish markets as well. We do have a couple of games localized to Japanese. So each live ops event that goes out, we are always making sure that it's been localized to the countries that the game it's been localized to as well. Uh, even when it comes to promotional content submission or in-app events promotion on the App Store, I'm always trying to uh, put it, uh, like localize it to as many languages as possible, or, or at least to those where it makes sense. Uh, recently, 
like the downside with the promotion content and live ops for submissions and updates, the downside would be you don't really want to promote yourself in the Indian markets unless this is your like target audience. Basically, you don't want to localize your games to those uh, markets you don't want to really expand into. Do you have any key insights for, you know, new inspiring developers for live op events and, you know, keeping those communities tight and continuing to grow that retention? Uh, in terms of increasing your organic visibility and uh, maybe trying to fish some, uh, f like trying to fish for some featuring as well, I would recommend take a look at what's popular on the stores and uh, take a look at the, uh, not genres, but more like uh, the collections that are being promoted, what's like the hot topic and what's trendy and try to align your live ops with those themes as well. Usually helps to bring a spotlight from the editorial team to your game or to your event and it helps to get help, like helps to get you into certain collection and increase your organic reach try to stay relevant to the topics which are being promoted on the on the stores that that helps a lot a lot try to pay attention to, to features from a specific store that are being promoted like the accessibility features or uh, uh, some new features like for example for apple specifically uh, they are very, very happy in case you build around uh, like themes or even develop the game around their features. They they are that are very, very specific to their devices and to their uh, to their store. So keep that in mind. For Google, I would say they do have like a calendar of uh, topics that I that are being promoted on a regular basis. Usually, ninety percent of them are the same the uh, like all year or uh, like every year. Stick to those. That helps as well, but try to stay unique with your event at the same time. There's like a fine line you can find with it. And uh, well, then I think try to find events that might resonate with your players the most. Like for us, I can give you the example of Trade Station 2. Uh, we've there's been like a huge uh, success with implementing a construction type of event where the players were actually able to visually, they were able to see the visual progress of uh, constructing the region. Uh, it was a uh, the whole point of the event was uh, basically repairing the like the land and event and certain land sites uh, after being after being struck by a tornado and the players were actually repairing those sites and uh, those landmarks and they were able to see the progress of their work visually uh, the retention was great and uh, we actually implemented the this particular live ops into the regular gameplay increased the metrics crazily. Like this, this has been a huge success with that and a lesson learned from us coming from the live ops event. So you're saying to basically follow the trends or not the trends, but what else is being, you know, promoted and the schedule of things. So does that really fall along with like holidays? Cause sometimes I feel like, okay, everybody's going to do a Christmas event, you know, like everybody's going to do a Chinese new year event. Everybody's going to do a summer vacation event. Should you double down on those or maybe not make the Christmas event so big? Or what do you, what do you think about holiday events? What I can tell is that we've been doing them every time. We never, never skip those because those tend to be like the, speaking from a monetization side of you, those has been the best event so far. Like Christmas, people tend to spend more. Uh, there are some holidays that are not so uh, like hugely promoted for some reason, but yet people are still at home. They want to, they do have extra time and they don't know how to spend it. And for example, that's Thanksgiving. And I've only been told this, and it was like a light bulb above, above my head that came out just recently. Somebody mentioned uh, the Thanksgiving. A lot of people are at home. Nobody's actually doing like a lot of, they're not putting a lot of effort in uh, creating some sort of live ops events, targeting specifically those dates. And there's like a huge opportunity we could try to take advantage of. For Thanksgiving, because it's such, you know, an, you know, a Western, holiday would you suggest theming it after thanksgiving or just having a live off event like a good one during that week i'd say good one during that week might be sufficient you don't have to go mm -hmm. all crazy with the with the themes and screenshots or whatnot i'd say just time your live ops event to go and be there live during that week and it should be good to yeah. go but that, that's yeah. but that's just my theory at this point and working all these years in in, in same titles and and seeing how everything evolves, how what's the biggest change that you have noticed on live ops, and 
if you're a small medium studio, how often you should do live ops to don't get crazy on to don't overwork because it feels like now this few these last years and it's gonna be a similar trend in the next years. Everything in, is moving into live services games, right? And in moving into more live ops. What's the biggest change that you have seen, and how would you recommend people to adapt without getting too crazy, especially if you are a medium studio that can be cannot be doing two live live ops events every week or one per week? What's your take on that? Yeah, I would say do at least once per month uh, because if you're not going to do it, somebody else will. And uh, people, whether we like it or not, I think they get bored pretty easily, even if the game's like super fun. Including live ops events in those games makes it even like better fun and increase the retention definitely. There's also a huge monetization opportunity that you're not miss you you are missing out on if in case you do not implement implement the live ops into your games because you can introduce battle passes you can introduce some seasonal offers anything comes to mind even if you're a smaller studio this can be basically like you it can save you introducing live ops to your game so i'd say i'd say do it at least once a month it can be a small event but just do it there's a there's a huge opportunity and huge potential and it can actually save your studio yeah, it's some, sometimes it feels like some games, are, it's, it feels crazy because they have like two or three events going on and you just log in, you open the game and you have to redeem 1,000 rewards, like yeah. one for coming yeah. back for each event. What do you, what's your take? Because I just saw on LinkedIn a few days ago, like it, it was one example of Life Ops where they did combine all the different rewarding systems, right? Like you logged in, mm -hmm. you unlock uh, this event, you like th they, they had all the combinations. What do you think about that? Do you think it's overwhelming for the player in your experience? Or do you think it's something that it's rewarding positively, positively for for the user to spend more money or to remain more time in the game? I would want to say like, let's look at the data first. But if we don't have the data, from my personal perspective, it's uh, I feel it feels super great when you log into something and all you have to do is basically open a Hearthstone, like 20 Hearthstone packs, open so many, I don't know, loot boxes, and you are just receiving those rewards and receiving those rewards. Uh, then the downside effect of this is like when you log in the next time, you don't get so many rewards. You just get like, I don't know, one or two, and you kind of maybe ex are, exp are expecting more. But that might be at the same time there might be like a driving force behind the player like i want to keep play uh, keep playing more and receive some more rewards and more loot boxes and more i don't know this and that so for me personally it would work okay but i do get it might be very very overwhelming for some players to just log in they want to do their daily session and they all of a sudden they have to spend five minutes collecting rewards which are which are maybe not so relevant to them they don't even want them they didn't like the live ops event they don't want they don't know what to do with those specific coins that are related to that specific event they didn't play so um i mean what's the fine line there let's look at the data and see if it works yeah, of course. And, and also when it comes to data is to, I guess you have to leverage the, to don't make loose value to all the currencies that you have in the game if you're giving away too much, right? Because exactly. then probably they're, they're going to try to monetize by, by ads or just, I know many players and I've done this before, sorry about that, just to do the daily login to get the rewards <laughs> and be mining yeah. the whole week just, just to get it for free, right? So I guess it's the data is, is a key factor when it comes to to put the value of your life ops and your engagement and rewards, right? Yeah, definitely agree. I mean, we are very, very, I would say, we, I'd say, I want to say we are a hundred percent data driven company. And, uh, there are the only examples when we don't go with data is we, when we go with our guts and, uh, specifically speaking from the ASO perspective and, uh, communications between the game team and the ASO team would be like, they want to have certain set of screenshots in in the store because they think they might be communicating uh, communicating the gameplay better which they might but in case the user are the users are not converting like what's the point of having them there they might look prettier they might be even more accurate but at the same time they are not performing better than the the other ones that we have so it's always up to discussion but within pixel federation the game team they will always have the final word so are we just going to have to adapt <laughs> I've been there like you can promise you can show the data but it 
it's not ultimately your decision and that can be no, kind of wrenching. <laughs> yeah you're like but i did all this work i showed you the power and it just kind of falls <laughs> flat which is yeah. can, can, can be tough do? i definitely yeah it's it's a hard life out there <laughs> well very cool i don't want to take up too much of your time so i did want to end just with one quick question if you had a time machine and you could go back and you could give yourself a cheat code to where you are now and you know maybe even move faster along what would your cheat code be oh that's an excellent question uh whew. i'd say hmm, i don't even know because it, um to be a bit pessimistic about the whole ASO world, I don't think that much has changed in like a recent four years. Uh, like the ASO is pretty, it's been around for some time. It's been structured this way since eternity, I think. And it's going to be the same way. The only major changes that I've seen uh, that has been like, has been going on, has been the introduction of the promotional content and the live ops, uh, the in-app events. And basically what that meant for us is just we've been given the power to to promote the offers ourselves instead of basically begging the play partners or uh, app store partners to please feature us. So uh, I got no normal answer no to that. <laughs> no, cheat no cheat code. No cheat code. It's always been <laughs> this way, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's been like minor tweaks and the yeah, the interaction of the live ops, the promotion content, but I think that's it. I think we get Right. What, which do, might be I a good it. time for anybody who's just trying to get into ASO, like you have not right. missed on much because it's been pretty much the same it's for a long same. time. I'm a big yeah. fan of the promotional content because it does, now you don't have to make the pitch decks anymore. You can just submit yeah. the promotional content and hopefully you get featured. <laughs> but um, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Well, thank you so much for being here. We really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed talking to you. Um, I feel like we kind of had a lot in common, at least by what we do in terms of for our company. So um, yeah, super awesome. Hopefully I can meet you in person. We will be at GDC. Thank you for having me, guys. It's been a, it's been a pleasure and a very interesting talk indeed. Thank you, everybody, so much for watching and listening. Make sure to follow along for future episodes and like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you again soon.